So just a reminder, today is our second last uh, seminar series. Next week is going to be our very last one. Um, so next week, I'm just going to be doing a very general uh, list of topics. I'll do like a um, little bit on randomization, a little bit on doing a uh, power and sample size calculation, just kind of a Everything that I haven't talked about so far, I'll put into that last little lecture. So no specific topic for the last one. Um, so just a quick re uh, review of what we did in the last lecture. So we started out with uh, something called Pearson's co correlation coefficient, which gave us an interpretation of uh, the linear relationship between two variables, how strongly correlated those two variables were in a linear fashion. Um, we also looked at simple linear re regression, so we wanted to look at a scatter plot of two continuous variables and find sort of a best fit line to those two variables, and so we looked at how to do that mathematically. We looked at how to investigate some of our model assumptions through some basic resi residual diagnostics, and so we saw how to detect uh, non-constant variance, and we saw how to uh, see if there was potentially a variable missing from our analysis. And finally, we did a very simple example of multiple regression and how to interpret the parameters that came out of multiple regression. So today we're going to go on to the analysis of variance more commonly known as the ANOVA. This is something that is absolutely essential for you to know. It's used very, very often in biomedical sciences. So if you recall two lectures back to our independent samples t-test, we were comparing the mean of a continuous variable with respect to uh, a binary categorical variable. So just looking at the mean of this continuous variable within two different groups. And we had the assumption that the outcome variable followed a normal distribution within each of the two groups. Well, the ANOVA, in particular what we call the one-way ANOVA, is a generalization of the independent samples t-test to two or more groups. So in t-test you have to have exactly two groups, and in ANOVA you can have two or more groups. And you can show that if you do uh, a one-way ANOVA with only two groups, that that is exactly equivalent to doing uh, an independent samples t-test. So usually if you only have two groups, even though you could run a, an ANOVA, you would usually just go for the t-test. But if you have three or more groups, you would go, have to go for the ANOVA. You wouldn't have a choice. All right. so. Notation, so we have um, our continuous variable, which we'll call y. So we're looking at the mean of this variable within k different groups. So as we always do, we have to define the parameters of interest. So we start by uh, assuming that the true population mean of the variable y within each of these k groups is den are denoted as mu1 all the way up through mu k. Um, so wh when we do an ANOVA, we, we're not investigating individual differences between each of these means. So we're not looking at the differences between mu1 and mu2, mu2 and mu3, mu2 and mu k, that sort of thing. We're actually just looking at what we call an omnibus test. So we're just looking at an overall test of differences between the means. And maybe this will become more clear when we look at how to set up the hypothesis. So our null hypothesis is simply that all of the means are equal to each other. Mu1 is equal to mu2 all the way up through mu k. And our alternative hypothesis is that at least one of the means is not equal to the rest. So that could mean that you, know, you only have one mean that is different from the rest. You could have two means that are different from the rest. Or you could have all the means are completely different from each other. We can't really separate out these scenarios. All we're testing against is whether uh, or not they are all equal to each other. 
Yeah, so if we do reject our null hypothesis, we don't know which groups in particular are significantly different from the rest. Um, so, a little bit of notation. So we use two subscripts now. So we still have uh, the first subscript is an I's, which tells you which individual you're talking about. And the second subscript is, uh, show, is telling you which group you're in. So YIJ just means individual I in group J. We have N sub J subjects in group J. So we can have different numbers of subjects in the different groups. So for example, the individuals in the first group are just Y11, Y21, all the way up to YN11. And if we were to sum up all of the, the NJs, so sum up the counts of individuals in each of the groups, then we would end up with N without a subscript. So that's just our total sample size over all groups. So it's the same thing as, as it was before. So I'm, I'm going back to my, to my usual sort of plot where I look at some simulated data and I show you how we construct our statistics. Um, so in this case, I have n equals 9 total observations. So here the horizontal axis uh, doesn't, it, it's not a variable, it's just giving you the observation number. And the vertical axis is going to give you uh, the value, the observed value of, for each individual. So that's our, our y variable. And so assume we have k equals three different groups. So we have a blue group, a purple group, and an orange group. And we have three uh, observations from each group. Well, something that uh, we saw in the very first lecture was just taking the mean of all of the points. So, and we can plot this as just a horizontal line on our plot. And yeah, so what I've done here is I've just completely ignored uh, what group each individual is, is in, and I just plotted the mean over, over everyone. And in the context of an ANOVA, we refer to this as the grand mean. So that's just the differentiate from the within group mean. So the grand mean is just over everybody. So we denote this by y bar. So easy enough to remember, that's what we've seen before. Just put a bar on something to denote the mean. And just the, with a subscript grand, just to, so we know that we're talking about over everyone. So if you write it in summation notation, it looks like that, but it's probably easier to understand graphically. You can also look at the group means. So all you're doing is you're just, so for the blue group, you would be taking the mean of the three blue observations, you do the same for the purple observations, and you do the same for the orange observations. And so we denote this as yj bar. So that just means the mean of all individuals in group j. And so these are the, the main things that we're interested in studying, whether the, the, the means of these different groups differ. Repeat the question, please. Even though they use a microphone, repeat the question. Okay, I'll do that. Sure, thanks. Yes, yeah, so, um, so yeah, we're interested in comparing differences between these means. Okay, so, as we did in the t-test and as we did in linear regression, we, we have the quantity that we're interested in studying, but we also have to consider our measure of variability to determine whether or not these differences are significant. And in the analysis of variance, there are different ways to characterize variability, which is why it's called an analysis of variance. So as before, we look at the sum of squares of different quantities. It just turns out to be a very mathematically convenient quantity to look at. And each of our measures of variability is called 
a, a different kind of sum of squares. So I'll just quickly go into what these different sum of squares are and what they mean. So the first one, again, this is something that you've seen before. So all you do is you take the difference between each of the individual observations and the grand mean. So if you're below, then it's going to be negative. If you're above, it's going to be positive. And we would take the squares of each of those differences and just sum them all up. So this is, just gives you um, a measure of overall variability in the data. And in the context of ANOVA, we call this the total sum of squares, or SST. Um, and, and yeah, so in, in this, we, we completely ignore what group each of the individuals come from. We just do this over everybody. We can also look at another type of sum of squares, which we basically look at the difference between the mean of each group and the grand mean. And we call this the sum of squares between groups, or SSB for short. So if you imagine that these, uh, that the sum of squares between groups is large, that would mean that the means, the group means are very far away from the grand mean, which would also imply that at least one of the group means is far away from the other group means. So if we want to reject our null hypothesis, then we want this sum of squares between groups to be large. And the last sum of squares, which is maybe a little less obvious to calculate, but in this you calculate the, the difference between each individual observation and its corresponding group mean. So for the blue points, you would just uh, calculate the differences between each of those points and the mean for the blue points and do the same for the purple and the orange points. And then, as before, you would just take the squares of each of these values and sum them all up. Okay, so if you imagine that the sum of squares within groups, as we call this, is large, then the, the points on average are going to be very far away from their corresponding group means. And so if that were to happen, then we would be less confident in in any observed differences between the group means. So essentially, we want the sum of squares between means, so the thing that's measuring the differences between means, to be large. And we want the sum of squares within groups to be small. Well, you can show that. The total sum of squares, so the first thing I showed you, is actually the sum of the sum squares between and the sum squares within groups. So this is uh, sort of something that we've seen before, where we, when we look at the variation in our data, it can, be exp uh, it can be written as kind of an explained part, so something explained by our model, the, the different groups, and kind of an error term, everything that's left over once your variance has been explained. Um, yeah, so here I'm just reiterating what I just told you about how we want sum squares between to be large and we want sum squares within to be small. And more in particular, we want this uh, sum square to be in, sum square between to be large relative to sum square within. So we're actually going to take into account both of these values in the test statistic. So before we can compare these two values, we need to make a, a little correction. So the, the thing is that if you think about adding more and more groups and more and more samples to your analysis, 
the sums, the sums of squares are naturally going to get bigger just because you're summing up more things. So we have to make a, a little correction just to take into account the, the total number of groups that we're comparing in our analysis and the total number of samples that appear in our analysis. So to do this, we look at what's called the degrees of freedom for each quantity. It's something, if you remember back in the t-test, we had kind of a measure of degrees of freedom that we were looking at. But in the f-test, we have two types of degrees of freedom. So the first degrees of freedom is called the degrees of freedom for the between groups comparison. So that is just k minus 1, the number of groups that we're considering, minus 1. Then the second types of degrees of freedom that we look at is just the degrees of freedom for the within group comparison. And that just ends up being n minus k, or the total number of subjects minus the number of groups that we're considering. So from there, it's very, very simple to get to what we call our mean square terms. So all we do is we, to calculate the mean square between groups, we look at uh, the sum square between groups, and we just divide by the degrees of freedom for that. So divide it by k minus 1. And for the mean square within groups, we take our sum squared within and divide by its degrees of freedom, dividing by n minus k. And so that allows us to then formulate our test statistic. We have something that we have two quantities which measure different kinds of variation, but they're sort of scaled down so that they can be compared properly. Okay, so in the ANOVA, we do what's called an F test. The F stands for, for Fisher, who is a very, very famous statistician in the 20th century. Um, and so th this ends up looking a lot like the, the T test that we saw before in the independent samples T test and, the, and in linear regression. So as usual, we have um, kind of our signal on the numerator, so the mean square between groups, so the thing we want to be bigger if we want to reject our null hypothesis, and we have the mean square within groups on the denominator, so the thing that we want to be smaller. So if our denominator is smaller, then we're more confident about uh, the differences that we observe between our means. And so you can just, of course, write that in terms of your sums of squares. Um, but yeah, so the point is that the larger the value of this F statistic, the more we are to believe that the null hypothesis is not true. OK, so we compare this statistic to a distribution as we did in the t-test. This time we use uh, something called the F distribution. And this distribution is going to depend on our two degrees of freedom parameters. So the degrees of freedom between and degrees of freedom within parameters are sometimes called the, the numerator and denominator degrees of freedom, just because the, the between appears on the numerator and the within appears on the denominator. That's just some alternate um, sort of terminology that you might see in certain publications. So the F distribution looks a lot different than our normal and our T distributions. Um, this just gives you an idea of what the shape of the distribution looks like, like in terms of the two degrees of freedom parameters. So here the, the M is the first degrees of freedom parameter and the N is the second degrees of freedom parameter. You can see that it's very much a, a, a skewed distribution, skewed to the right, meaning that it has a heavy tail on the right. And so, yeah, this is just showing that the type of distribution that you compare to depends on the degrees of freedom, which in turn depends on the number of samples you have and the number of groups you're comparing. And as before, we want to compare our observed F statistic to the right tail of this distribution. So if our, F, if our observed F statistic falls um, very much on the right part of this distribution, then 
we can reject our null, null hypothesis. So if we choose a significance level, um, alpha, as we always do, then uh, we can calculate our critical value. So there's three things that go into our, to our critical value with the F-test. So the, the second thing is just uh, the first degrees of freedom parameter. We have our second degrees of freedom parameter. So just the things that we calculated earlier based on the sample size and number of groups. And then we have our alpha, which is our significance level. So if we had chosen an alpha of 0 0.05, that would mean that we are looking for the value along this horizontal axis such that the area to the right of that value is 0 0.05. And if our observed F statistic is greater than that critical value, then of course we would reject our null hypothesis which would give us evidence that the group means are not all equal to each other. And otherwise, we would not reject our null hypothesis. So before I go into an example, I'll just do a few kind of assumptions that we make in the ANOVA. So, um, so as, as before, we assume that the values of the outcome variable are normally distributed within each of the groups that we're comparing. They don't have to be normally distribu distributed overall, but when you consider values within just one group, it should be normally distributed. Um, we also have to assume that the variance within each of the groups is equal. And finally, we have to make our usual assumption that um, observations between different individuals are independent of one another. Also, that means that you don't have, say, repeated measures from the same individual because then you would have correlation between their uh, two measurements. Okay, so I'm going to go into a quick example of the ANOVA. And actually, this is an example from from agriculture, it's actually, it turns out it's, it's very difficult to find a good ANOVA example that's publicly available and uh, is in the biomedical field. But as it turns out, this example is, is a really, really good example. So I'm looking at um, my, my outcome variable is the dry mass of rice shoots, just from rice plants. So this is just a, a, a factorial experiment looking at different things like uh, rice variety and fertilizer. So we have here three types of fertilizer and we have 72 total observations. So that's our little n without a subscript. And we have 24 plants in each of the treatment groups. So and because the, the sample size is the same within each of the treat, treatment groups, we call this a, a balance experiment. And so if we look at our box plot of the different treatments, well, it, it, it looks like we do have different means between the three treatment groups. But of course, in this first um, fertilizer treatment, there, are, there, there is a very large amount of variability. So it's hard for us to say for certain that we're confident that there are overall differences between the means because we see so much variability. But looking at this just visually isn't really going to answer any questions for us, so we can then go ahead and do our one-way ANOVA. So if you were doing this by hand, of course, you would calculate the mean uh, dry mass of the shoots within each of these fertilizer groups. So 57, 48, and 72. Our degrees of freedom of the, of the between group comparison is the number of groups minus one. So three minus one is two. The degrees of freedom for the within group comparison is uh, the number of observations in total minus 
the number of groups. So 72 minus 3 gives us 69. And when we do an ANOVA, we usually summarize our results in what we call an ANOVA table, which is a very nice way to, to put all of our values uh, into a readable format. And in, in, an, in an ANOVA table, we have um, the first column gives the, the source of the variation. So we have our between and within groups and just our, our total. The second column gives us the, the sum of squares. As you can see, that can get quite large in some cases. The third column, we have our degrees of freedom. Fourth, we have our mean square values. And then we have our F statistic. And usually we put our p-value at the very end. And so th this ends up being very, very readable because for, let's say, we're just looking at the between groups, we have our sum of squares. So we take this and we divide by our degrees of freedom and we get our mean square value. And we can do the same for our within groups. If we just take this sum of squares and we divide by the degrees of freedom, we get that mean square value. And then to get our F statistic, we just do the mean square between groups divided by the mean square within groups. So our, in this case, our F statistic is 2.82. And if you go, of course, you don't actually have to do this, but I just went and looked up the critical value for, this, for these two degrees of freedom at significance level alpha equals 0 0.05, and that turns out to be 3.13. So that would suggest that, well, so si since our observed F statistic is less than the critical value, we actually do not reject our null hypothesis at significance level alpha equals 0 0.05. So in this example, we do not have enough evidence to declare that there are overall differences in means of um, the shoot dry mass in terms of the fertilizer treatments. But let's just remind ourselves that this is an overall test or an omnibus test, so we do not know specifically which of those fertilizer groups differs with respect to the other ones. However, if you do get a significant um, test in, a, in an ANOVA, then you can proceed to do what we call post hoc tests. And these are going to allow us to compare the individual means of the different groups, so pairs of means, uh, rather than doing like this overall omnibus test. But when you do this, you do have to be careful, because this introduces something we've sort of vaguely alluded to before, multiple testing. So you have to remember that every time we do a, another statistical test, you actually increase the chances of getting at least one false positive by just a little bit. So if you do a large number of comparisons, then you, you have a higher probability of finding a false positive somewhere among those comparisons. And so most post hoc tests are set up to minimize the ch chances of getting a false positive. So, so rather than doing a whole bunch of separate tests at a significance level alpha equals say 0 0.05, we have to do each of those tests at a slightly um, using a slightly stricter threshold than we would otherwise. And there are tons and tons of post hoc tests out there. To be honest with you, I haven't even heard of probably three quarters of them. Um, and each of them has their advantages and their disadvantages. So I'll, I'll give you a few of them that I know. These post hoc tests aren't something I'm super familiar with, but um, so here are some of the more common ones. Probably the, the easiest one to, to understand is what we call the Bonferroni correction, which means that we would take our significance level alpha and just divide that by the total number of tests done. So if, if our 
alpha or 0 0.05 and we were doing five tests, then we would uh, use a new threshold of 0 0.05 divided by five or 0 0.01. And then we could go ahead and calculate t statistics based on the new significance threshold. So yeah, this is a very simple procedure. It doesn't like it's not mathematically intensive, but it also tends to be very conservative. And in particular, so I come from the world of statistical genetics, where we might be doing hundreds of thousands or even millions of comparisons. And in that case, the bond Ferroni correction tends out. Turns out to be way, way too conservative. You're never, if, if you divide your signif significance threshold by something like 500,000 or a million, you're just never going to find a, a significant, um, a significant difference. So, another type of post hoc test is called Tukey's test. So this one is is less stringent than von Froni. And it turns out this, that this one is a good choice when the sample sizes are not equal uh, between the different groups, and also when you need confidence into intervals for pairwise differences. There are also other procedures which are called stepwise procedures. There are various options available that you can look up. In, in that case, we would order all of our p-values from, from smallest to largest, and we would use a very strict threshold on the smallest p-values and a less strict threshold on the larger p-values. So it turns out that this one is better when we do have equal sample sizes between groups and we don't actually need confidence intervals. In this case, you don't get confidence intervals out of those tests. And another one which is popular is called Sheffet's method. And this, in addition to looking at pairwise differences between the means, this one can be used to investigate more complicated comparisons called contrasts. And so, for, for example, a contrast could be something like you compare the, the mean of two groups to the mean of the third group. So rather than just comparing two groups at a time, you could have the mean of two groups to, to the mean of a, of a third group. Um, yeah, so um, I don't have, don't have an example in the slides of post hoc examples, but I can show you in SPSS afterwards how to run post hoc tests. Um, so how do you choose a post hoc test? Well, like everything in statistics, there's no sure answer to this question. Um, despite the large number of these tests available, there are some of them that are standard. So if you just do Google search for post hoc tests, you'll see some that come up regularly. So you want to make sure that you look into uh, which one is the best for your study and what kind of comparison you want to make. So yeah, back here I gave you a couple of, you know, rules of thumb, where if you have unequal sample sizes versus equal sample sizes, whether or not you want um, confidence intervals or you don't want confidence intervals. Also, I think the total number of tests you're doing usually plays into the choice of post hoc tests. If you have a large number of tests that you're doing, certain post hoc tests might not perform as well. So there's lots of little things that you might need to consider. The point is you just kind of have to do your research into choosing your best post hoc test. Um, I was doing some reading into this, and some people say, oh, you should only want, or you should only run one post hoc test and then just leave it at that. Personally, I think it's okay if you run multiple post hoc tests, but you do have to be careful because by doing that, even though an individual post hoc test um, accounts for multiple testing, by doing multiple post hoc tests, you're reintroducing multiple testing. So if you do run more than one post hoc test, you really should report the results of all of them. And what you definitely should not do is just run a bunch and pick out the one that gives you a significant result. Okay, so that was the one-way ANOVA and our post hoc tests. So I was planning on just quickly going into the factorial ANOVA, the, the multivariate version 
of ANOVA, but before we do, as usual, we can have a quick uh, round of questions. Um, okay, so I have to repeat the question. So the question was, um, how many groups would you have before you would decide to, to do um, a postdoc test that accounts for multiple testing? I would say if you have more than one, you should correct for multiple testing. That's just my answer. <laughs> Yes, so, so so I mean so 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 the point is yeah so the joint the 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 value of 0.05 is completely arbitrary but so if you're doing if you're looking at two groups that, that's still one comparison so that's fine right if you're looking at three three or more groups so the moment you get to three groups, you're looking at three comparisons. So I would say right there, you should be doing multiple testing right away. So the, more, the moment you're doing more than just one test, you should be correcting for multiple testing. Um, I have a question. Um, so if the, the, the program that I use describes it actually does not permit me to run an ANOVA if I don't have equal numbers of samples in each group. Can you comment on that? So that I think goes back to a very, very old-fashioned sort of thing where there was a simplification. I, th I think the ANOVA simplifies, like if you do a hand calculation, it simplifies greatly when you have equal numbers between groups. And so that's probably what that's representative of. In general, in an, in an ANOVA, you don't need to have equal numbers of samples between groups. And I'm sure in GraphPad, there's some way that you can run an ANOVA. So for example, in SPSS, there's, um, uh, there's two ways you can run an, an ANOVA. There's one that's explicitly labeled as a one-way ANOVA. And there's another menu, which is called a general linear model. So it never actually uses the term ANOVA, but that's really what it's running. So I'll, I'll show you how to do that in SPSS, but I'm sure in GraphPad there's got to be some way sure to do possible. that. Yeah, it's absolutely possible. Yeah. Thank you for this question. If you have different ends, how do you measure the degrees of freedom? Um, that's a good question. Um, I, I I think it still ends up being the same. Because the degrees of freedom only takes into account the total number of samples, not the number of samples within each group. And Total. And, and is the total over all groups. Yeah. Okay, so, so yes, up till now we were only looking at one grouping variable, but of course we might be interested in more than one grouping variable. So we're looking now at the mean of the means of a continuous variable with respect to multiple categorical variables. So in the case of, of two grouping variables, we call this a two-way ANOVA. And so and so in, in general, we, we call this a factorial ANOVA. So specifically, if we're looking at two groups, it's a two-way ANOVA. But if we're looking at just some indeterminate number of groups, uh, indeterminate number of categorical variables, then we call it a factorial ANOVA. And 
this kind of analysis goes very nicely with uh, the classic uh, sort of factorial experiment where you have sort of different treatments and different blocks and you want to investigate um, different effects of combinations of your treatments. Um, and so once you, uh, like I did in the, in the linear regression, once you get into the multivariable case, it gets a little bit more complicated with the math. So I'll just sort of leave out the mathematical details, but I'll just give you the interpretations. Um, but the point is, it still is, you still are analyzing the variance. So you're taking the total variation and you're decomposing into um, different terms that explain different parts of the model. And you end up with a leftover sort of unexplained variance uh, once you've uh, explained all the variation in your model. And in the factorial ANOVA, we basically have the same assumptions that we do in the one-way ANOVA. We just need uh, normality within each of the combinations of groups. And we need independence of observations. And we need um, uh, constant variance within each of the combinations of all groups. So a quick example of a two-way ANOVA. Let's say we're looking at the effects of a drug, which we call drug A, in, in men and women on systolic blood pressure. Uh, so assume that we have three dose groups for the drug, A1, A2, and A3. So say A1 could just be like, uh, like placebo. Um, so we, we, in the factorial ANOVA, we look at two kinds of effects, and they are called the, the main effects and the interaction effect. So the main effect is sort of what we saw in the multiple linear regression, the, the, the B terms in the multiple linear regression. So it's essentially looking at the effect of the one categorical variable on our outcome variable while the other variable is held constant or, or held fixed. So in this example, there's two main effects, one for each of our categorical variables. So the main effect for the drug it's basically going to investigate the overall effectiveness of the drug over the different doses, regardless of whether you're uh, a male or a female. Then the main effect for, for sex is going to investigate whether mean blood pressure is different between the males and the females for fixed levels of the drug. Then finally, the interaction effect it sort of tests the combined effect of the two grouping variables. So in this case, we only have one interaction effect. So the interaction between the drug and sex is going to investigate whether the effect of the drug on blood pressure is different in men and women. So when we get to even a higher order ANOVA, so say something with three or more categorical variables, okay, things are starting to get fairly complicated. The interpretation of all the main effects is the same as what I, I just said. It's looking at just the effect of one of the categorical variables while everything else is held constant. Um, we can look at pairwise interaction, so we can look at interaction between the first categorical variable and the second, or the second and the third, or the first and the third. But we can also look at even higher order interactions. So considering all three categorical variables at the same time. But the thing is that once you get, once you introduce more and more categorical variables into your analysis, these higher order interaction, interactions become very uninterpretable. So usually we, we don't go any higher than looking at interactions between pairs of variables. And as before, we use the f-test and we investigate each effect through a separate f-test. And 
as we had before, just remember that for each effect that we do look at, a significant result does not tell us which, so, so, so right now, I'm only talking about one uh, categorical variable. So within that categor categorical variable, we have different groups. So a significant group, a significant result doesn't tell which particular groups differ from the rest. So if we, if we find a significant main effect for, for the drug A in our example, it's not going to tell us which uh, dose is actually the one that differs. It's just going to t give you a general idea that the dose does have an effect on the mean blood pressure. So I'll do a quick um, example of a two-way ANOVA. So if you recall the example that I showed you a few minutes ago of the dry mass of uh, shoots in rice plants. So before we considered the fertilizer type, so we had three fertil fertilizer types. And now I'm going to consider the variety of the rice plant. So we have a wild type versus this non-wild type variety. And again, we have um, a balanced experiment. We have the same number of units within each of our combinations of fertilizer and rice variety. So we have 12 within each um, combination of fertilizer and rice variety. So here I've just given a table of some of our descriptive statistics. So the point is that when you look at things in a table form, when you have multiple categories like this, it can be very difficult to sort of uh, pinpoint an effect or, or, or a trend, if you will. So doing the ANOVA and doing the post hoc tests can help you sort of um, gain more interpretation of differences between combinations of groups. So in SPSS, you're again going to get an ANOVA table. When you do a factorial ANOVA in SPSS, um, it looks a little bit more complicated than, than the one-way ANOVA table. So you have, you have a few things. You have something called an intercept, which is actually just the grand mean. Um, and you basically everything I've outlined in red here is what we're interested in in our factorial ANOVA. So we have a line for the uh, level of uh, fertilizer, and we have a line for the variety of rice plant, and then we have the interaction term. So the interaction is just represented by the, the multiplication signal uh, sign here. So fertilizer times variety. And so we get uh, a separate S F test for each of these um, comparisons. And so as you can see, we have the p-value, the corresponding p-value of each of these F tests. In this case, all of them ended up being significant. So as you can see, the fertilizer main effect, so is significant, and if you remember, it wasn't significant before. And so we have evidence that the fertilizer level is associated with the dry mass of the rice shoot. So this is a really good example of um, when you include an additional variable in your model that you think is going to be important in your model, it can actually improve the efficiency of your estimate of another factor. Before, we didn't have any sort of significant result, and now we do. The variety of the main effect is also significant. So that gives us evidence that the rice variety is also associated with, shoot, with mean shoot dry mass. And we also found that the interaction term was significant, which means that we have evidence that the effect of the fertilizer on the shoot dry mass depends on which variety of rice we're considering. I'll show you um, an example in SPSS of what this interaction effect actually looks like. Because in, in sort of image form, it's a lot easier to picture what's going on. All right, so 
our take home message today before I get on to the tutorial. Um, so doing an ANOVA usually leads to better power, and by power I just mean the ability to detect <coughs> true associations than you would get if you just did a bunch of pairwise t-tests between all of your groups. Um, something that works very nicely, ties in very nicely with experiments that you might be running uh, in the lab. You have a whole bunch of different uh, post hoc tests available if you do actually want to test um, differences between the individual groups. But as I said, remember, you don't want to do any p-hacking. You don't want to do a bunch of them and then just take the significant one. You want to try and choose the best one for your analysis. And if you do multiple ones, then you should report all of them. And finally, something I hadn't mentioned earlier, but I want to stress is that even though we assume norm normality in the ANOVA, the ANOVA actually turns out to be kind of to be pretty robust to violations from this assumption. So in particular, if you have a, a large sample size, you don't have to worry too, too much if you don't think your data come from a normal distribution within each of the groups. Okay, so there's the lecture part, and before I go on to the tutorial, we can have another quick question session. Uh, one question involves the two values that we can see. It was like 0 0.000. How we can uh, find the exact uh, number? How many zero we have? Yeah. So the question was, um, in the p-values here, they're, they're just rounded off to 0 0.000. So in SPSS, there is a way, essentially what you would do is you would double click on this chart, and then it, it would open up an editor for the chart, and you could choose the number of um, uh, decimal points that it shows. I have a question. I didn't know that you would be um, okay, so the question was, um, if you don't have uh, normally distributed data, you still use the ANOVA? Well, you, you have a couple of choices. One is um, there is a, a, a non-parametric version of the ANOVA that you can use. So that, that version does not assume a normal distribution. So you could use that. Or as I had mentioned, if you have a, a good enough sample size, you can just go ahead and run the ANOVA even if you don't have normally distributed data. Yeah. Okay, and you said that the uh, you have more than two groups we have to use ANOVA. And with ANOVA we have uh, the data different from that. But if you want to see also, like, if we have uh, three groups today, we start with A and B and B and C. Is there, which one do we have to do? What, what does it have to do? So, so in that case, what, so I guess the procedure is, if you have, um, if you find, so you, you always start by doing the ANOVA. And if the ANOVA is significant, then you would go ahead and perform your post hoc test. So doing those comparisons between A, B, B, C, and A, C. But if the ANOVA, if the ANOVA is not significant, then you would usually just stop there. and You wouldn't do those further tests. So I guess, uh, just to clarify one thing, you mentioned that if you have more than two variables, you wouldn't do more than two variables. You would compare any two groups against each other. So do you then report two, three p values? Um, sorry, just, just to clarify, you're saying so you can go ahead and do the ANOVA on on more than two categorical variables. But what I'm saying is that you wouldn't include higher higher order interaction terms in your ANOVA. So you would still have all of your all three of your categorical variables in the ANOVA at the same time. You just wouldn't look at interactions between like three-way interactions. Is, or a two -way. No, it's it's a, it's actually a three-way ANOVA, but just with some terms left out. Yeah. Okay.
Okay, um, I guess we can move on to the tutorial. Doing pretty good for time here. Okay, so the data set I have today is exactly what I showed you in the, in the lecture, in the slides. So we have this rice shoot dry mass data. So we have one column here which gives us the shoot dry mass. We have like one variable which gives us the, the level of the, the type of fertilizer used. And we have another variable which gives the variety of the rice plant. If you look in the, the variable view, you can actually see, even though they're coded as one and two, uh, you can see that the information of the actual names of the different fertilizer types and the varieties are indeed present in the SPSS data file. So the, even though things in SPSS are coded numerically, the the sort of more interpretable version is what will what will usually appear in uh, in your output and in your plots and that sort of thing. Okay, so to run a one-way ANOVA, we go to as usual analyze. We can go to compare means, and we just go to the one-way ANOVA at the bottom. And so our dependent variable in this case is the shoot dry mass. So we'll move that into the dependent list. And our factor, so that's, the, that's our categorical variable, is just going to be the fertilizer. So we'll move that into the factor spot. And here on the side, you can see that it gives you an option to do your post hoc tests right away. As, as I had just mentioned, normally you only do the post hoc tests once you've actually seen that your ANOVA is significant, but you can get it to just do the post hoc test right away. So you can see there are a whole bunch of uh, different options here. Don't get excited about the first one, LSD, that's the least significant differences. Um, so we have, uh, I'm gonna do Bonferroni and Tuki Chefe. So you just select them, click OK. And I think you can also, um, that you can get it to output some descriptive statistics by clicking on this options. And then from there, you would just click OK. So it gives you all of these tables. So it starts out with the descriptive statistics, which just gives you your, your counts in each, in each group. It's going to give you your means or standard deviations. So just some nice things there. And here's the ANOVA table that it's going to give you. So exactly the same as what we saw in the slides. So this is, as we saw, this had a p-value of 0 0.06, so not significant at level alpha equals 0 0.05. And here's where we see our post hoc tests. So on the very left column, it gives you the type of post hoc test that you're looking at. You have Tukey, Sheffe, and Bonferroni. And then most of this is redundant. The, the mean differences and the standard errors uh, Actually, the mean differences, yeah, those should all be the same. But really what you're interested in looking at is either the significance level or the confidence interval. And if we look here, the Bonferroni should have the highest p-values because it's the most strict. So if we compare 4, 0 0.47, 0 0.3, 0 0.55, 0 0.6, yeah, yeah. So Bonferroni is definitely the most strict. Um, so yeah, and, and, and again, you, some of these comparisons are, are redundant as well. So here you have F10 versus NH4CL, and you have that same comparison down, down here, NH4CL and F10. So that's just something you have to be aware of. But yeah, so normally because you don't have a significant result here, you would just stop there and you wouldn't bother with the post hoc test. So I'm just showing this for the sake of um, showing you how to do it. Okay, so if you want to do a factorial ANOVA, you actually go to a different um, 
area. And so this is what I was referring to earlier, Josie, where it doesn't sp specifically say that it's doing an ANOVA. So you look under general linear model and univariate. And so what you would do is you can put in your dependent variable as before. So shoot dry mass. And we can put in our factors that we want to compare. So fertilizer and variety. So I'll move those in as fixed factors. And again, you could do other things, like you could do post hoc tests if you wanted to. You can look at what I had mentioned, contrasts, where you look at more kind of advanced comparisons between uh, your different groups. Um, And you can also, if you click on options, you can get its um, output different means for different con combinations of variables, that sort of thing. So if you run this, then it's going to start out by giving you your usual descriptive statistics. And then it's going to give you your ANOVA table. Again, the same thing that we saw in the slides. Um, you just have to kind of be careful because there's a lot more going on in uh, in this ANOVA table than we than we saw before. Okay, so we saw that for both fertilizer and variety, the main effects were significant, and we also saw that uh, the interaction between the two was significant. So I'm just going to show you a quick plot that gives you a better interpretation of what a significant interaction term means. So a good way of looking at this is if you go to your chart builder, under graphs, chart builder, and you go to um, a line plot. And the second type of line plot allows you to plot multiple line plots on one, uh, on one graph. So I'm going to select that. And I'm going to put um, the fertilizer type on the x-axis and the shoot dry mass on the y-axis. That's going to allow us to see how fertilizer affects the shoot dry mass. But I'm going to set the color of the individual lines to be the variety of the rice plant. So I just drag, drag that up to this box up here. And so if I run that, It's going to give me this really nice plot. So as you can see, we have our fertilizer types. And on the y-axis, we have the shoot dry mass. And then we have our different varieties. So the, the wild type is in green at the top here, and the non-wild wild type is in blue. And so this is a really, really good example of an, of an interaction. So you can see that for the non-wild type, for the blue curve, the F10 variety has the lowest uh, shoe dry mass. Then the NH4CL has the second highest, and the last one has the highest. Whereas for the wild type rice, the, um, the F10 fertilizer actually has the highest mean. And then it goes down for the NH4CL, and so I guess both for both NH4CL and for NH4NO3, they're more or less the same thing, but there's a big difference in the F10 fertilizer for the wild type versus the non-wild type. So if there, were no, if there were no interaction, then you would see that these two curves would be parallel to each other, so that would mean that the effect of the fertilizer on the shoe dry mass would be the same regardless of what rice variety you have. But if there is interaction, that means that the effect of fertilizer differs based on the wild type. And so you'll see that these lines will not be parallel to each other. All right, so that's everything I have to show for the factorial ANOVA. So any questions about my little tutorial? Nope. Okay, great. Uh, Thanks, everyone.